You, you or you want to live in a world with no trees? Imagine, no trees, no oxygen, no life. Each day, more and more trees are being cut down and the little amount of trees in our world has had many negative effects on living creatures. Have you ever stopped to think about how many trees are being destroyed to make things that we want but don't need? Deforestation is a worldwide issue that needs to be stopped. Deforestation has an extremely negative impact on land animals. 80% of the Earth's land animals are found in forests and sadly around 20% of them are losing their homes due to deforestation. 50,000 species of animals each year are disappearing because of this. If we don't start to decrease the amount of trees being cut down, we could be putting another 10% of the Earth's animals at risk in around 25 years time. Forests are cleared out for many different materials and liquids that we use. For example, palm oil, paper, latex rubber gloves, sponge, chewing gum, and chocolate. There are many, many more. These are all things we think we cannot live without, but really, we need trees more than we need these things. We can reduce the amount of trees being cut down in many different ways. One way we can do this is by recycling. Recycling reduces the need of raw materials so that our forests can be preserved. Another way we can do this is by trying to mainly buy products that can be recycled. Shopping with your parents is boring, am I right? You can make shopping interesting. Read the labels. Understand what you're buying. Know that the product you're buying is green. Green is good. Green is safe. Green is recyclable. With the rapid amount of trees being cut down, our oxygen levels are depleting, which is increasing global warming. Just one tonne of recycled paper can save 17 trees, 1,439 litres of oil, 2.3 cubic metres of landfill space, 4,000 kilowatts of energy, and 26,498 litres of water. This represents 64% energy savings, 58% water savings, and 27.21 kilograms less air pollution. Isn't that incredible? Did you know that 3.5 to 7 billion trees are being cut down each year worldwide. Sadly, this means that 2.47 million trees are being cut down daily. If we don't act now to decrease the amount of products we are using made from our precious trees, we could be putting all living creatures' lives at risk. So help now to make a better future for everyone. Words are powerful. Every word you say has an impact on the people around you. So, I'm asking you to make sure your words have a positive impact. Recently, on the soccer field, a boy said to me, that was a good kick for a girl. Now, he was just trying to be nice and give me a compliment, but by saying, for a girl, it turned into an insult. This got me thinking, why aren't girls and boys treated equally? Why are women paid less than men? Why do some girls have to fight for an education? And why do some women face violence in their own homes? Women and girls make up over half of Australia's population and comprise 47% of all employees in Australia. And yet, they take home an average of $251 less than men every week. Did you know a woman would have to work an extra 56 days to earn the same amount of money as a man for the same job? To further make this point, let's look at the number of female chief executive officers in Australia's largest companies. 
In a 2017 report, it was revealed that less women run top Australian companies than men who were named John, Peter or David. 32 were named John, 32 were Peter, 21 were David and only 19 were women. But wait, we've missed a step. In order to have a job, you need to have had an education. Luckily, all of us here today are fortunate enough to receive one. However, 62 million girls go without an education all around the world purely because they are female. Though, there are people fighting to decrease this statistic. One of those people is Malala. Malala is a 21-year-old girl born in Pakistan. In 2008, the Taliban stopped girls from going to school. Malala loves school and spoke out publicly on their right to learn. Because of this, at the age of 15, Malala was shot on the left side of her head by religious extremists. She survived the attack and is still fighting to ensure that every girl receives 12 years of a free, safe and quality education. I tell my story not because it is unique, but because it is the story of many girls, says Malala. Women have to experience many unimaginable hardships like domestic violence. Domestic violence is an abusive, violent or intimidating behaviour in a relationship. One Australian woman is killed every week by either her partner or former partner. Domestic violence is also one of the main causes for women and children becoming homeless. It is horrific, and yet it is still happening today. International Women's Day is celebrated on the 8th of March every year. We have this day to celebrate women and recognise all the hardships that they have to experience. Though International Women's Day has been a huge step forward for women, I would like to see the day come to an end. Not because I don't think it is important, but because I would like to live in a world where women are treated as equals every day. But men, when, but men and women are not treated equally. Women are paid less than men. Some girls have to fight for an education. And some women even experience violence in their own homes. And these are just a few of the issues faced by women and girls all around the world. But the first step to fixing this is by making a positive impact on the people around you. The next time you see a girl do something impressive, don't tell her she did it well for a girl, just tell her she did it well. Choose your words carefully. Clear blue water, beautiful sandy beaches, golden sunshine dripping through coconut trees. This is Tuvalu. Imagine visiting this Pacific island paradise. Beautiful, isn't it? Well, about five twelfths of Tuvalu is now underwater. Why? Could we be contributing to this? What can we do to prevent this? Talofa, Kiora, Bula, Maloelele. Hello to our judges, teachers, students, family, and friends. Tonga, Samoa, Fiji, New Zealand, Vanuatu, and Tuvalu. Why are we seeing less and less of these heavenly islands? Repeat after me. The answer, the answer is, is hazardous waste dumping. Hazardous waste dumping. This isn't something you would like to hear because we are contributing to their demise and suffering. All of the rubbish we throw away end up in a big pile in the Middle East of the Pacific Ocean. Scientists of the Ocean Cleanup Foundation have conducted the most extensive analysis ever of this waste area. This pile is known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and is 1.6 million square kilometers. That's bigger than France 
Germany and Spain combined. This includes 80,000 tons of waste, 1.8 trillion pieces of rubbish, which is approximately 250 pieces for every human in the world. Although cleanups have occurred, what would be the point if we continue to use plastic and carelessly discard it, only to have it become an addition to the waste problem? Another dilemma our Pacific group of islands is facing is global warming. Global warming has been increasing sea levels by combining the ocean with meltwater, the liquid from glaciers and ice caps. This increase in water level will lead to the consumption of our beautiful islands. The President of the Republic of Kiribati, President Anote Tong, warned that his country's present climate catastrophe and its imperiled future is everyone's responsibility. The Pacific Islands' contribution to, to greenhouse gas emissions is very minor, yet they are far more greatly affected than us, the people who are actually responsible for this. We should all stop our use of, of non-renewable sources of energy and look into using renewable sources more widespread. The Pacific Paradise needs us to make sure that future generations will also share its beauty. In the words of President Anote Tong, the earth is not ours to do as we please. We are merely trustees for future generations. We ignore this reality at our peril. Thank you for listening. I'm scared. Why have my parents given me away to this man? I'm scared. My fingers ache from blisters and cuts. I'm scared. Every shoe I make, I just feel more and more hopeless. I'm scared. Starvation dominates my body. I feel as if my stomach is turning. I'm scared. If I die here, would anyone care? I'm scared. I feel like I'm trapped, not only here, but in my own head. I'm sad. I'm, c I'm cold. Is this a better life than poverty? No. No, it's not. Although I was poor, I felt loved. Loved by my family. But how could they do such a thing? I'm a slave. I'm a slave to this man, this monster, but it's not just me. There are many, many other boys and girls. Every day, we wake up to the sound of vigorous shouting and the smell of pollution. Get up, that man shouts every morning. If we don't, we receive a smack from the man's unblemished hands. Every night, I dream of a better life, not only for myself, but for my family too. I dream of a better life for all those who are here with me, trapped, and strive for freedom from the monster that is slavery. I wish for wealth for those who have sold their children in desperate need of food, water, and money. I understand our families had nothing, but, but why achieve it this way? Someone, help me. I'm trapped in this isolated building that reeks of gasoline. Please, I, 
I just can't take this anymore. 195 countries. 195 countries. Do you want to know how many allowed child slavery? 76. 76 of our countries where it is legal to enslave children younger than you. This is pure malevolence and inhumanity. 76 countries where it is legal to work children, innocent children, to the bone and then leave them in horrendous conditions. 1.9 billion children, about 20% of the world's population. Five million of those children are victims of child slavery. Five million children are pushed into abhorrent working places. Are you serious? This is unacceptable. This is where we all draw the line. So I want you all to look around. You and I are so lucky to live a life just like this. You and I could have been one of those five million victims of child slavery. You and I could have been trapped making products for a company that doesn't care about anything except for money. Both of us could have been sold to strangers by our own families only to work countless cruel hours. So I want you to do me a favor. Tell others to avoid possible products of child slavery. This way, we will never support one of the main things that prevents us from a perfect place. So I'm going to leave you all here with a quote. There are three different types of people in this world. Those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who say, what happened? Who will you be in this world? Have you ever shook a can of Coke and gave it to your friend to experience the joys of exploding it all over themselves and then laughing in their face? Well, today I'm here to open up a can on an issue that means a lot to me. I recently went to the Philippines. I remember driving on a busy street and it was very dark. I was immediately drawn to a cardboard box flattened down and a person with ragged clothes on. And then I realised he lived there. This made me feel sad. I couldn't just drived past without doing something about it. In the Philippines, I get to stay in a nice hotel and have buffet meals. The reason why I'm sharing my recent Philippines trip with you all is not to show off, but rather because of this main message. Poverty is like Coke. It's everywhere all around the world, and we need to do something about it. A Filipino girl and her family lives in Manila, which is the capital of the Philippines. During the day, she works hard to complete her daily chores with her mother, takes care of her baby sister at the age of 13, and at night, she's forced to sleep outside on the streets. She and her sister go through many difficulties. Once, her sister went missing. Two kids had taken her away 
and put her in a sack and left her there for four days. And that's just one of the challenges that they have to face. <coughs> Think about our daily challenges. Now compare them to theirs. So when you're challenged or in a bad mood, think about the little girl and her sister who lived in poverty. Almost 50% of our world's population lives in poverty. 50%! Think of a can of Coke, which costs about $2.50. Half of our world's population lives on less than $2.50 a day. And the people that are extremely poor live on $1.25 a day. Out of the one billion children that live in poverty, 22,000 children die. I don't know about you, but to me, this is just not good enough. Someone really significant to our school is Mary McKillop, a woman who took care of the orphans, the homeless, and the people that lived in poverty. She said, never see a need without doing something about it. This reminds us to hashtag be like Mary. To all the adults in the audience, the next time you're pressured to buy the latest iPhone or the latest trends, ask yourself, do you really need it? Will this make you happy? Or can you entertain yourself and be grateful for what you've got? And to all us kids, remember to think about the little girl and her sister who lived in poverty. When things don't go your way, or your parents can't afford everything that you think you really want. Think about being grateful. So the next time you see poverty, will you slow down to think about how fortunate you really are? Or will you just walk to pass? Thank you. Who here is deathly terrified of heights? Raise your hands, come on, don't be shy. Hooray, I'm not alone. Now this specific fear is also known as acrophobia. Acrophobia is defined as an extreme fear of phobia of heights. Now, you might be thinking, oh, that is perfectly valid. I wouldn't like falling off a mountain. For acrophobes like me, this mountain can literally be the physical equivalent of three meters up the rope tower in my local park. But I like to call it, let me get to the top without me freaking out. <laughs> the last time I ever made it to the top was when I was four years old. And to this day, I make it halfway before I freak out and jump back down in absolute fear. And keep in mind, this is on a good day. But these let me get to the top without me freaking out towers aren't the only enemy us acrophobes have. The Ferris wheel is another nauseous nightmare. Instead of leaping into one of the colorful carriages happily and watching the spectacular view of the glistening sea and the skyscraping skyscrapers, I instead just shut my eyes, going into my own safe paradise with my iPad, infinite food, and a cozy blanket whilst praying that this nauseating torture would end. I also remember this one time where I was at a school camp and one of the activities we did was rock climbing. There were three options to choose from, easy, medium, or hard. I obviously chose easy. It clearly wasn't. <laughs> I looked up at the top. It was higher than Mount Everest. Thankfully, this wasn't an actual mountain, but it was just as intimidating as one. 
I had the safety straps glued to my shaking body, and I began climbing upwards towards heaven. <laughs> I tried to shift every limb and use my remaining energy to land and grip onto the rocks. But I made a massive mistake. <laughs> Take it from me, okay? Never look down. <laughs> Guess what I did? I dared to look downwards, only to see the students cheering me on, the clumps of pale green grass and rock. Was this how I was going to die? <laughs> Falling off or making the wrong move would change everything. I clearly didn't want to die. So I immediately jumped back down in absolute terror and realized I wasn't even halfway. <laughs> Good job, Diane, pat on the back. <laughs> well, what have we learned today? That acrophobes can struggle like a flower growing in the rain, but hopefully fight this fear and defy many expectations of this acrophobe stereotype. So as acrophobes, I invite you to unite with me as one. Together we can tackle the mountains, ferris wheels, and climb to great heights. Maybe just one step at a time. <laughs> I could even try climbing up. Let me get to the top without me freaking out tower again sometime. Signing off, Diane, your local acrophobe. Before I ask Miss Cathy Ferrari to come up and give us some judges' comments, I would like to just reintroduce all of our judges and thank you once more for all your efforts this morning. T closest to me is Miss Cathy Ferrari. Give her a round of applause. And Cathy, Cathy is the team leader for literacy, uh, so she looks after literacy across the diocese. Uh, next to Kathy is Mrs. Judy Jordan. Judy Jordan, a former teacher librarian in our diocese, so thank you for coming along and helping us out today. And standing next to Judy is Mrs. Moya McGuinness, former principal within our diocese. And to her right is Mr. Scott Carroll, who's one of our mission religious education teaching educators. So, Ms. Ferrari, could I ask you to come up and give us just a few judges' comments? Thanks, Mr. Lindvay. Um, I'd just like to congratulate and thank all our speakers this afternoon. Because what? Sorry, this morning. Because what a treat that was! There were so many different engaging topics. They spoke to us. They had fabulous eye contact. It felt like they were talking just to us. Um, but I know they were making eye contact with all of you as well. They used great um, pacing, intonation, all sorts of things, expression, all the things that we want everybody as a speaker to, to do. And it was just, it was a wonderful morning, really. I think um, we had to deliberate quite hard, actually, within there because the quality of the um, speeches this morning were spectacular. So I'd just like to thank you all. Um, Thanks to your parents, your teachers, and all your students for the feedback they've given you along the way. Um, yeah, congratulations and well done. I'd like to ask Mr. Scott Carroll to come forward to present the Catholic Education Officers Social Justice Award. Now, as Mr. Carroll is coming forward to do this, I did mention Mr. Carroll when we started because Mr. Carroll, apart from being a teacher in the diocese and now a teaching educator, was actually a student at a Voice of Youth grand final himself. All the judges, I'm sure, would agree with me that while it was a joy, this challenge of, of choosing somebody, when so many of these speakers gave beautiful speeches on, um, on the social justice issues of their choice, this is, a, this is a big challenge. So just quickly, social justice is about being aware of issues in our society which are not fair and which need our attention. All of our speakers today who focused on a social justice topic have raised our awareness. We're now better informed and we know more about those issues. Awareness is just the first step though. Our challenge then is to act. 
Pope Francis said that energy put into social justice has the capacity to build bridges between people and individuals. And these are bridges that can overcome the walls of exclusion, indifference, racism, and intolerance. So with that, that was something we were really impressed with today, was the call to action. And the call to action that this person had in mind when they were giving their speech um, was delivered with incredible personal passion as well. And so it is with great pleasure that I present the Social Justice Award to Dana Adan. I'd like to ask Mrs Moy McGuinness to come forward to announce the winners. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lenvey. Well, boys and girls, mums and dads, what a brilliant morning. How wonderful were all these speakers here. Any one of them could win. So our runner-up today, who spoke beautifully, who was excellent, is Tara Stoll. In judging today, the boys and girls were so very, very close. It was not easy, I can tell you. Not easy at all. The winner today is Christian Durant. <laughs> 